Brasil, um, do IMPA. Uh, he uh, got the Fields Medal in 2010. And today, in the Magna Lectures uh, series at IMPA, he will be talking on large particle systems and Landau damping. Please, Cedric. Okay, thank you very much, Jacob. Everybody hear me? Yes. It's a great pleasure to be here. This is indeed my first visit in Brazil. I am sorry that I cannot stay so long, but uh, already it's a good, uh, a good uh, start for giving me some good feeling of this wonderful environment that you have here at Impa and uh, beautiful Rio. And uh, uh, thanks a lot to Jacob and all the Impa for the invitation and it's uh, really great, the warm welcome that I received while coming here. Today, I will talk about Landau damping. I will talk about particle systems. This will be lecture uh, that for large part will be aimed at general scientific audience. Some parts will be a little more intricate, but I hope the most, the large part, the main flux of ideas is accessible and there will be some historical reminders. Let us start our story with one of the most important events in the history of science, as we like to think about it. This is the Newton's law of universal attraction, gravitation. 1684 is the date in which this law was published, although Newton discovered it almost 20 years before. Just he waited very long to publish it. One can only speculate why, but maybe he was quite aware of the revolution that this was. Newton's law of attraction, why is it amazing? Because first it's very simple, and uh, it states whenever you have two masses, the force which is exerted by one mass on the other is like the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance. And with just one simple law like this, he's able to recover essentially everything that was known at the time in celestial mechanics. Here I'm a bit exaggerating, but a, a century later when Laplace, uh, Lagrange worked on this, they showed that indeed with the Newton law you could explain all the observations that were known at the time, with just one law. However, at the same time, Newton, even though he establishes the equations for the system, here, for instance, you have the equations for planets in the solar system, assuming that the planet is reduced to a point, which is okay if you look from a distance. And uh, you have n masses, maybe the Sun and Mercury, Venus, the Earth, and so on. Each of these planets has a label and a mass, and then you ha it has a position, and you write a differential equation about the acceleration. The acceleration of each planet is determined by the resultant of the forces which are exerted by the other planets. And here in the equation, this is like an equation in a gradient form. Well, it's Hamiltonian equation. The potential comes from a gradient, and the potential from which it comes is the Newton potential of interaction, 1 over x. When you take the derivative, you have 1 over r square. At the same time, as Newton finds these equations, which look simple, he understands that this is a bit dramatic because he has no way to predict the future of these equations. And since then started the problem, what do trajectories of uh, classical mechanics uh, equations look like in large time. We had the idea from Kepler that a planet orbits around the sun forever. But now Newton arrives and tells you this would be true if in the, in the universe there was just the sun and the planet. But then you have to take into account the other planets. And uh, Newton shows that for just two bodies you can integrate but then for three bodies, 
it's impossible to integrate. And this, in a way, is frightening. Then comes the, or maybe it, you can think of it, it's a piece of luck because it gives you many interesting problems. But uh, the, from that time comes the oldest question of mathematical physics, is the solar system stable? In the sense, take the equations, can you on the basis of the equations predict that the solar system will remain like what we know forever, or maybe will there be some dramatic change? And the problem has been discussed for centuries. Now, in the solar system, of course, to understand the trajectory of the Earth, I have to take into account not only the Sun, but also Mars and Jupiter and so on. But these other influences are very small compared to the influence of the Sun. Think that in the solar system, I don't know if you see well, maybe we can diminish a bit the light here on the other blackboard, if there is a possibility. A bit li light, a bit less near the blackboard, if that's possible. Mm, some small change, whatever. Here, you see on this, uh, on this picture, this is the uh, sun showed with the other planets. And you see very well that the sun really is essentially all of the solar system and the rest is just tiny bits. Even Jupiter, which is monsterly large compared to the Earth, Jupiter is about one thousandth of the mass of the sun. So really there is a small parameter which is the mass of the planets and the influence of the planets compared with the influence of the sun. However, a small influence over many, many years can become large. If your bank account drops by one over a thousand every month, if you wait a thousand months, you will be bankrupt. Okay, it's a long time still. But in the case of solar system, you want uh, it to be over very long durations. Now look, if uh, we have an influence that is one thousandth, and typical time in the solar system should be about a year, then uh, in thousand years, maybe the effect is monster. So the solar system should change over a period of about thousand years. This already Newton understood was not possible because we have records that show that it has not changed that dramatically over the centuries. And then a lot of discussion came with Newton thinking that there had to be some divine intervention to help the solar system remain what it is. Then started the controversies and so on, Leibniz versus Newton, whatever. Many people thought about this and contributed. And then came people like Lagrange, Laplace, Gauss. They made beautiful work to show that because of the equations, okay, I should have added Poisson to them. Not because of the structure of the equations, it's not one over epsilon that you have to wear it. It's one over epsilon square at least. From 1,000 years, you go to the million year scale now. And this is much more comforting. Then, still, even if it's one million year of stability, you want to know what happens on much longer periods. Maybe because you really care, or maybe because you think there are some interesting things to discover. And Poincaré attacked this problem uh, at the end of the 19th century, and this was one of the founding events of modern dynamical systems, which is one of the most developed topics here, in a way can be traced back to this problem of stability of the solar system. And Poincaré showed how much it is sensitive to the condition, this problem. Maybe you have a solution that is stable, and you uh, push by just a few meters one of these planets and the solution changes completely. Unstability. And then this came the idea of chaos, the idea of ergodicity, the idea that we cannot solve this question and that if there is no rule, okay, maybe it's stable over a million years. Uh, still, if we wait long enough, anything can happen. Anything can happen, and basically this is what people thought in during the first half of the 20th century, to simplify. And then came Kolmogorov. 
in the middle of the 20th century. And Kolmogorov completely changed the dominant mood. What is now known as Kolmogorov-Arnold-Moser theorem or KAM theory uh, considers the solar system or solar system in a more general framework, framework of Hamiltonian systems, which, let us say to simplify, are like classical mechanics systems with conservation of energy. And in this, what Kolmogorov taught us is this. If you take a Hamiltonian system that is completely integrable, that is, you can solve it in a way, compute all the trajectories, and uh, this would be a system like the solar system if you neglect the planet-planet interaction. Just take care of the interaction between the sun of the planet. This would be completely integrable. And then you had a small perturbation, which you can think of as the planet-planet interaction, put here a small coefficient epsilon, then with large probability, if epsilon is very small, you can have a probability that is very large, with large probability, the system will remain stable for all times. Not just one million year or a billion years, but all time. This really was a very strong statement. Not only it was a very strong conclusion, but there was this introduction of probability theory that was beautiful. Okay, I don't want to make a definite prediction because we know it's unstable, but still I can show that with large probability there will be stability. Uh, this was uh, remarkable. And uh, this really changed the view that people had. There was this view that conservation laws, once you have take, made the list of conservation laws, everything that remains possible is allowed will occur sometime. And now Kolmogorov shows you that no. After you made the list of conservation laws in the solar system, even though it's perfectly allowed for two planets to collide because there is no rule that prevents it, this will never happen with large probability. Let me mention at this point that even though this was the original motivation, the solar system, the technical assumptions used by Kolmogorov do not include the solar system. It was much later that this extension was performed using the ideas of the late Hermann, and uh, this was published in paper of 2004 by Jacques Fejoz. But even though this was not uh, including the solar system, and even though epsilon in the theorem of Kolmogorov had to be very, very, very small, this really changed the way that mathematicians and physicists considered the long time behavior problem. There is, in fact, some interesting epistemologic paradox here. The Kolmogorov Arnold Moser theory essentially never applies to real systems. In the case of planets, I told you epsilon is like 10 to the minus 3. Well, it should be, I don't know, 10 to the minus 15 for the theorem to apply it. And then you can check how large it should be and to the minus something, that something is much less, is much more than three. So KM theorem does not apply to real systems. However, it has really changed things in classical mechanics, uh, getting rid of this idea that everything that is allowed will occur. And the KM theory's ideas then have been exported to many more systems, not just planet systems. This is part of the common history of sciences uh, of uh, 20th century. Now, if you don't care about solar system, but you want to think globally, you can think of the stability of a galaxy. Galaxy can be 100 billions or even 1,000 billions of stars. Yes, Jacob, uh, you want to make some comment? Okay. Obrigado. Obrigado. So, what about the stability of a galaxy? Well, in Kolmogorov Arnold Moser, depending on how many planets you count, uh, if Pluto is allowed or not, or if you count the moon, you have uh, 
uh, 9 or 10 or 11 equations, something like this. But with a galaxy, you don't want to have 100 billions of equations. It makes no sense because you cannot take care of it, you cannot even write the result, so you don't want to take into account all these equations. Moreover, theorems like Kolmogorov, Arnold, Moser, they behave very badly in large dimension. As the dimension increases, epsilon becomes even more and more ridiculously small. So you want to do things from a completely fresh point of view. For this reason came another approximation of interest. Very often in science, because life is too complicated, we like to identify a situation that is a reference model that is simplified. In the case of Kolmogorov, Arnold, Moser, we took as a reference the planets that are interacted only with the sun because we want we can treat. Because this was allowed because one of the masses was much larger than the others. In a galaxy, maybe there is this, uh, you know, there is this super, super heavy, uh, big uh, black hole in the center of a galaxy, typically, which is much, much larger than any star, thousands of times larger. But still, compared to the huge amount of stars that you have, it's only a negligible portion of the total mass of the galaxy. So you cannot use the same reasoning. Instead, what you can use as a reasoning is replace your stars by something that would be more like a fluid. One object, but a fluid. And uh, this is not unreasonable when you look at galaxies. We are used to the idea that uh, stars are like more or less fixed over the course of a year or something. But if you look on large periods of time, the stars will move. And look how it looks like. Let me show you this movie by astrophysicist uh, John Dubinsky from Canada. Okay, here we'll see the behavior of galaxies. And uh, over a large period of time, look what happens. These are all the stars go here and there. They are blurred. Many things occur. You see regions of high density, regions of low density, and so on. It looks like a big mess. It is, actually. Let's see. Let's look another one. Oops. Let's see this one. Oops. This is like what happens after some time. When you see over b millions and billions of years, this is what happens to galaxies. And uh, it's uh, very difficult to say anything intelligent when you contemplate this, like even what question should we ask to understand this better? You can marvel, however, at the beauty of this. Here there is only the Newton interaction taking into account. Just the stars attract each other and look how complicated it can be. Look the beautiful picture of two galaxies that collide each other. This maybe will happen to our galaxy in a few billion years. Now, to study this kind of thing, you see here, we see it clearly in this thing, it doesn't look like we see one star and one star and one star. We rather see a fluid with regions of high density and low density. And the idea behind the uh, approximation, the infinite dimensional approximation of mean field is precisely this, to replace our system of many equations, a complicated system of simple equations, by just one equation. Letting the number of particles go to infinity and see what we recover as a mathematical system there. So for this, we switch to, from an individual description of stars, where each star has a position that we record, to a statistical distribution of stars, in which we don't care to see if this star is there or not, but rather, how many stars are in this region or in that region? And uh, then the unknown is one probability measure. Depending on time t, it's a probability measure over positions x and velocities v that tells you, among all positions and velocities, how many are here, how many are there, etc. Like a statistical distribution, like you would do for a poll in some election, 
what's the proportion of people who will vote for this candidate, proportion of people who will vote for that candidate, and so on. And uh, whenever, how to derive the equations? Well, the equations of Newton are expressed in terms of sum. Like if I am a star, I look at the influence of all the other stars. It's a sum over all the other stars of the influence of each star. I replace this discrete sum by a continuous sum, which is an integral, in which the measure that I use is a probability measure. And here, for instance, to compute the Newtonian potential that is felt at point x from all the stars at positions x, j, I replace this by the integral of the Newton potential over the statistical distribution. And this has a structure of a convolution product between w, the potential, and mu, the measure. And in this way, we can get an equation for the measure mu. Of course, because there is no real miracle, the equation will be a bit complicated. Not that complicated, and let us derive it here. It's one of the equations that you can derive most simply, at least waving a bit your hands. In the Vlasov equation, that's the way it is called, although it would be more correct to call it collisionless Boltzmann equation, the important unknown is your density mu t, as I said, a probability measure in position and velocity, which depends at time t. And if you look at this uh, probability measure along trajectories, it is constant because the stars are not created or destroyed. They just move with the flow. Each one moved because of the forces. So mu t is preserved by the flow, but also we know from classical mechanics that the volume measure is preserved by the flow if we have conservative phenomena. Volume measure here, let us take its uh, position and velocity. So if I have two measures, each of which is preserved by the flow, then also the density of one with respect to the other will be preserved. And I will write an equation for the density of the uh, measure of matter. So the density is a function that depends on time, position, and velocity. And it is preserved along trajectories. It means what? When I time differentiate this function along the trajectories, time t, position x of t, velocity x dot of t, I find a zero derivative. And then I apply the theorem of derivation of composed functions, or chain rule, and this total time derivative is the derivative in time plus the derivative in position multiplied by the variation of position plus the derivative in velocity multiplied by the variation in the velocity, which is the acceleration. And then this is the velocity. This is the acceleration. As we know from Newton, acceleration is a force. So I will replace this acceleration by the total force exerted by the other particles. And I know how to compute this, like in the slide before. It's a convolution between the potential and the measure. And so we are. This is the so-called Vlasov-Poisson or Vlasov-Newton equation. And it's the basic classical model of plasma physics. Of oh, Sorry, plasma physics is true, but also galactic dynamics. It has been there for about a century. So df over dt plus scalar product of velocity by gradient in the x variable plus scalar product of the force with the gradient of the f in the velocity variable is equal to zero. And the force is the convolution of the Newtonian force by the density. And you can integrate out the velocity variables because they play no role in the force. In the Newton dynamics, whatever your velocity, only thing that counts is the inverse of the square of the distance. Now you have the equation and what to do, and you like to find some good theorems, some good understanding of the qualitative properties of this equation, and we hope to get some good understanding of the dynamics in the long term of a galaxy. Just a comment that as is the case for most of the basic laws of nature, the rigorous mathematical justification of this is still open. It's still open, well, it's non, people know how to do it when the force is smooth. 
but in the Newton interaction, in 1 over r squared, it's definitely not smooth when r goes to 0. So there's a difficulty, and the difficulty has been there for many decades. The best result allows 1 over r. This is far from 1 over r squared. Sorry, this is what we would like to have, and the best result is a logarithm. So there's a, an exponent 1 which is missing in terms of the potential. In terms of the force, we know how to treat 1 over r, and we like to treat 1 over r squared. There are other models that are more elaborate, that are more complicated to derive. One is the Boltzmann approximation, which in fact has come historically before the mean field approximation in the 1860s. In the Boltzmann approximation, you are concerned about collisions. Particle here, particle there. Maybe they collide like in a big billiard game. Or maybe two stars come very close to each other so that you cannot distinguish from a distance their positions. Then there is some interaction, and this results in a dramatic change in the velocities of the planets or the stars or whatever. In the Boltzmann approximation, a basic assumption is molecular chaos, which I will not describe precisely, which is the assumption, well checked in experiments, that particles before colliding, particles in a large crowd, they did not know each other. Because there are so many particles that when an encounter occurs, these two particles have not met before with high probability. There will be no relation between the velocity of this one and the velocity of that one. Just like people which encounter randomly in the world, they will not know each other before. This Boltzmann approximation adds a specific term, which is called the Boltzmann collision operator, which is quadratic because it describes the interaction of particle with another particle, pairs of particles. And it has a bit of a scary expression, but don't laugh, I made my PhD on this guy. And uh, uh, this guy, as I said, described what happens, for instance, V and V star, these are the velocities of two particles before the collision, and these guys are the velocities of particles after the collision, and so on, whatever. In plasma physics, they don't use this one, but they use another one which has resemblance and which is very useful to describe the interaction of electrons that pass behind, through each other, very close to each other. In galactic dynamics, they also use this one, the Landau operator. And uh, these equations, Boltzmann type or Vlasov type, are pillars of kinetic theory. The Boltzmann equation, you use it in rarefied gas dynamics. For instance, if you want to build a plane and you want to understand how is the pressure distributed around your, the wings of the plane, you use the Boltzmann equation to model the gas around the wings. Or if you're interested in the galaxies and the stars, you use the Vlasov equation with a Newton attraction. Or if you're interested in plasma and you want to work on nuclear fusion or whatever, thing like this, in which the most important is the interaction between electrons, then you use the Vlasov equation with the Coulomb interaction, which is like the Newton interaction, but you reverse the sign because the electrons, they repel each other. So these equations are fundamental both for uh, physicists and for engineers and for mathematicians. Boltzmann made a fantastic contribution that changed mathematics or some domains of mathematics. This is what we call entropy. The idea of entropy is very simple. And Boltzmann obtained it after the study of this equation. When you make a statistical description of some system, like I look at the statistics of the stars and not the stars precisely, of course, the new description has much less information than the previous one. So there is some added uncertainty. Even if I know the statistics, I cannot get the individual information. 
like in a poll, if you know that 50% people voted for this guy and 25% for this one and 25% for the third one, it's not as precise as you know that your friend X voted for this guy and this guy for this guy and so on. So there is some uncertainty in the microscopics that is in the behavior of each particle. Collect all the possibilities, you make the list of everything that's possible and you call this W. This is the total uncertainty. And Boltzmann tells us that the interesting quantity is the logarithm of this quantity W. S is K log W. This is uh, the form of the Boltzmann entropy, at least the form that Planck rewrote Boltzmann's work. This formula is at the same time simple, deep, and useful. Here you can see it on the grave of Boltzmann. So Boltzmann tragically committed suicide in 1906. And 100 years later, I was lecturing in a conference in his honor in Vienna. And I knew that the grave was there. So I had to go and meditate on the grave of Boltzmann. But then, this is Central Friedhof. If some of you have been there, you know it's a gigantic cemetery. And I arrived there. I know there are famous people there, but there is no explanation, no map. In the evening, there was nobody at the entrance. So I could have walked for hours and hours before finding it. But then I see these people on a bench uh, nearby, and I ask them, do you know where I can find a map? And the guy there said, there is no map. Who are you looking for? And I said proudly, Boltzmann. And then the guy looked at me with bright eyes, and he said, S is K log W. In this way, I understood that we were of the same secret, uh, you know, secret order or something. So, and, and he took me to the grave. You see that it's really magical, this formula. What can we do with this K log W? Boltzmann used it to prove a really big theorem that is known as the H theorem. Now, it seems Boltzmann meant this H to be a Greek eta. You know, eta in Greek, capital, is just like H. But of course, for everybody, it's H. And Boltzmann, what Boltzmann shows is first, he shows you in the case of a statistical distribution how to relate, how to compute it in practice. It's like a combinatorial exercise. I can discretize my distribution, and I can uh, see, coming from this f, what is the uncertainty that is in there, using the formula s is k log w. And he shows the good formula is minus integral of f log f. It's a simple combinatorial exercise. Uh, in mathematics, is known as Sanoff theorem. You can state it in uh, very abstract terms, beautiful. And this is important because you can go from the abstract formula to something practical that you can even compute knowing f. This you can also think of as integral of f times log of 1 over f. This later would be rediscovered in information theory in the same concept of entropy. It's uh, uncertainty. It would be rediscovered by Shannon. And the reasoning of Shannon is very simple. Suppose I have some distribution over words in a language. When I speak, there are some words I use. And uh, a word gives more information if it's a rare word. Or if a word is very common, you have very little information. The word grave is very specific. The word V is very basic. So let's start from the assumption that the more a word is rare, the most precious it is. So 1 over f is a measure, is something in which you want to measure the quantity of information that you receive from a word. And then if you receive a word here and a word there, if they are independent, the information should add up. Now we know how to add. Information dependent means that you take the product of the probabilities, 
And uh, if from a product you want to make a sum, well, you put a logarithm. And then if some words is very often, very often you'll have this information, so you integrate uh, with the probability measure that takes into account the frequency of words. And there it is, the exact same formula that was discovered by Boltzmann. Boltzmann, to be back with the physics, Boltzmann proved that for his model of Boltzmann equation, entropy can only increase with time, never decrease. If you put a gas in a box, entropy initially is very low, which means a very particular configuration, then it will become more and more a general configuration, disorder will increase, entropy will increase. This was fundamental because it gives a driving principle to explain some phenomena. Take, for instance, this experiment. You take your box, you divide it in two. In one half, you put a gas. In the other half, you put nothing. There is a vacuum. And initially, you remove the wall. What will occur? We know the gas will be aspired, will be pumped up by the vacuum. We like to think that there is a force from the vacuum that attracts the gas. But in the Boltzmann interpretation, it's not at all a force that does this. It's just randomness. Because the particles, they all do whatever they like. They all go in whatever possibilities. And they will tend to occupy what has the highest entropy, the largest uncertainty. And this is a situation in which they are all of one, the box. Because it's much uh, less possibilities to put the gas in half box than to put the gas in the whole box. Much more space to occupy. This is exactly like when you uh, look at, you put uh, children you see in the school when it's the time when the course is done and it's uh, uh, play time. They get out of the class maybe in order, but then they disperse everywhere. There is no plan for them to occupy the whole school uh, board, the whole, uh, the whole area. But they do, just because they do all kinds of unrelated things. Poincaré and the followers of Poincaré was not, were not happy with the Boltzmann discovery. This, in my opinion, is the worst mistake that Poincaré did. Use these his results to question the validity of the Boltzmann equation. However, we can forgive him because he made great contributions otherwise. What Poincaré pointed out is that he has a beautiful recurrence theorem that tells you that one day all the particles will be back in their initial configuration, or almost. So we will be back in a state of low entropy. But Boltzmann got the point. You will never observe this. It's true that someday it will occur. But this time is so large that by the time you are, we have obtained it, the universe will be, have ended. Uh, and even much longer than this, the rules of physics will not be valid. So there is no point in there. And uh, he comments on the idea of chaos, that the chaos, of course, cannot be true for all times, etc. This was subtle. This is not observable because it's so special. The associated entropy is too low, and you will never observe it in practice. Now, any reasoning that is based on probability, you have the feeling that it's not certain to occur or to not occur. But Boltzmann theorem tells you it's sure to occur. Why is this? Because the probabilities involved are so, so large. To understand this, let us compare the two situations. And this will show us why entropy is so powerful in these systems. Here, on the left, is a configuration. You look at all configurations in which the gas is in just the half of the box. And you compare this with all the configurations in which the gas occupies all the box. Each particle has access to a phase space that is twice as large. The entropy from here to here will go up by a factor of log 2, if you make the computation. And when you see this, you say, OK, 
log of two is not so large. But what does it mean? Assume that the number of particles involved is 10 to the 17, which is perfectly realistic. Then the volume of microscopic states compatible with this is 2 to the 10 to the 17 times larger than this. This 2 to the 10 to the 17 is a number so large you cannot even imagine it. Uh, to put it in perspective, imagine that you compare, imagine that you would compare the size of the whole galaxy uh, to the size of an electron, to the volume of an electron, or a proton. Some people say the electron has no radius, but the proton has. And you compare the ratio to this ratio of what you can imagine is the largest and what you can imagine as the smallest. Even this is a joke compared to this. You would have to repeat the process, take another proton inside the proton, like your uh, electron would be there, and take another one, and then repeat, repeat, and repeat. And repeat this like 200 <laughs> billion times. It's totally crazy. It's totally crazy, and the fact that you have such crazily large numbers involved explains you why this law of the increase of entropy is something you cannot go against, even though it's probabilistic. It's a driving force of the universe around us. And uh, this Boltzmann formula you can think of, so to recover, it's to recall its disorder and information. The system goes to more and more disorder, and the system goes to less and less information, that is, the uh, situation is less and less informative, is less and less particular. <coughs> So here is another anecdote, and then I will become serious again, so that you can recall this disorder and information stuff. One day I was uh, giving some interview on some uh, television, and after the interview was over, you know, you go to the, to the room, they uh, take up the makeup and so on, you discuss with the guy in charge, and there was this wall in which you can write, like put graffiti, like on the walls here in Rio, and he asks me, can you make something that is dear to you, write something that you like? And of course, I wrote the Boltzmann formula. <laughs> and I wrote disorder and information. And the guy looked at this and he said, this is great. <laughs> it's terrific. <laughs> and he said, disorder and information, it could be the slogan of our TV. <laughs> disorder <laughs> and information. And then he thought about it. And he said, proudly, it's better than order and disinformation. <laughs> Enough for the story. Now, back to the equations. What can we say about qualitative behavior? As you understood now from the Boltzmann equation with collisions, we have time irreversibility. Things become more and more disordered, more and more entropy. On the contrary, Vlasov equation does not have this. It's time reversible. If you look a movie in this way or this way, it's the same. Energy is constant in both cases. But on the left, entropy increases. On the right, entropy is constant. It comes well with the fact that in the Boltzmann picture, there are just a few equilibria, very few. The Gaussian equilibria. And this explains why if you take, for instance, in this room, you take a sample of particles here and you measure distribution of velocities, if it's at rest, we'll find a Gaussian distribution of velocities. This is what occurs through collisions. In the same way as in statistics, Gaussian uh, laws occur from error estimates in whatever. It's not the case for the Vlasov equation. The Vlasov equation, which doesn't have collisions, has infinitely dimensional space of equilibria. For instance, any distribution of just the velocity is an equilibrium. Not just the Gaussian, if you replace the square by a cube or by the cosinus or whatever, it will be an equilibrium. Of course, this is consistent with the idea that entropy increase stabilizes the system and it will force your system to go to a rest state, like an equilibrium, Gaussian. Here, you don't see anything, no stabilization. And so you think the system will not do anything. Maybe it will do whatever is allowed, and we can't say anything good about galaxies. However, in 1962, Lyndon Bell said, okay, 
good news is galaxies, when you observe them, they looked a bit like they are in equilibrium. And we have entropy increase in there, taking into account the close encounters. But bad news is this entropy increase is very, very slow. It cannot account for the relaxation. If we count on the entropy increase to stabilize the galaxies, we need to wait for a time which is larger than the age of the universe. This was uh, bad news, and so one had to find another mechanism. As is often the case in uh, celestial mechanics, and we see to today with black matter or whatever, Lyndon Bell chose to give a name to the ignorance. In this case, this was violent relaxation, which means it relaxes in a way that is fast, faster than entropy increase, but we don't understand why. It's well accepted, this violent relaxation, and you observe it uh, in practice. Lyndon Bell, however, had one argument. This argument was called Landau damping. Landau damping, to understand what it is, it comes from plasma physics, not from galactic dynamics. And let's go back in time to know what Landau damping was and why it inspired Lyndon Bell. In 1946, Landau made an amazing discovery. Amazing discovery is taken from a textbook of the time. This is Lef Landau. He doesn't look very happy. This is normal. This is a mug. Uh, my picture uh, was taken when he was sent to jail. In those times and those days in Soviet Union, you could be sent to jail for whatever reason. But then his friends took him out of prison. It was very courageous. I mean, pleading his cause to the authorities. And out of prison, he did great discoveries again. In particular, this one. He took the Vlasov equation around F0, around some equilibrium, uh, he was a tough guy, and he writes in the paper, like people who worked on this before, all their results are false. And they did not understand the point. And to understand the point, let's look at the linearization equation. And he shows that if you start from entire data, the force of the linearized equation often dumps to zero in large time. He uses the machinery of complex analysis and uh, convolution is a beautiful exercise. And he gives some rate. OK, in whatever the formula doesn't don't mind, there is a recipe. In many situations, you have a profile which leads in the linearization to a force that damps to zero. If the force damps to zero, this is associated with some homogenization of your equation. So a definite trend to equilibrium. And then people said, what the hell? There is no entropy increase in this equation. Why would it go to a steady state? And this is the Landau damping. Idea that perturbations may damp away spontaneously in an apparently irreversible way. This was the start of a lot of discussions about Vlasov equation and large time. Uh, Landau damping, if you read papers in plasma physics, they appear, Landau damping will appear in more than one quarter of the papers. It's really a fundamental thing, and you find a chapter on this in the textbooks and so on. And it's well accepted that what you find the Landau damping, which is a perturbative effect because it's linearized, you will also observe it in a larger out of equilibrium picture, and that is the idea used by Lyndon Bell to justify that there could be this violent relaxation. No one has another theoretical explanation based on dynamics for out of equilibrium. So this is why this study of this close to equilibrium situation is important also from the theoretical point of view. However, Landau damping, and this is very different from the Boltzmann law of entropy, the Boltzmann law of entropy is obtained by a completely nonlinear reasoning. But the Landau damping is obtained by a linearization approach. Now, we know the idea. When you are close to equilibrium, you replace the function by linear approximation and study this linear approximation. But here, what we're really interested in is not the equation itself, but the large time behavior. What in hell will tell you that the large time behavior of the approximation is the approximation of the large time behavior of the equation? It doesn't commute. And uh, look what we did to go from the nonlinear Vlasov equation, in which there is a force generated by the perturbation and the perturbation itself. You see here, H is the perturbation, F0 is the equilibrium. This is a nonlinear equation. 
and I replace the nonlinear term by zero to get the linearized equation. And you think, okay, if h is very small, this nonlinear term is quadratic, so it's much smaller than the linear terms. Okay. But what will happen in the large time? In large time, it turns out that this term here will increase much faster than this one. This one is constant, and this one increases linearly in time. So even if it's very small at the beginning, if you wait a large time enough, this term will be much larger than this one, even in the linearized approximation. You know, sometimes in exercises, in physics, in engineer, you say, okay, let's assume that this is very small. And you make many computations assuming it's very small. And in the end, you check that the quantity in the approximate solution is indeed very small, that it's consistent. And here you check if the quantity is very small and you find it's very large. So it's not very convincing. 1960, Bacchus said that this was destroying the validity of the linear theory and there is no, no a priori reason why the linear theory would reproduce the nonlinear one. All the more that it's known that in large time, with small effects accumulating, uh, you can have a large departure from the, from the linearization system. A bit like in large time of the Newtonian mechanics, the small effect of planets can lead to a dramatic change from the uh, situation in which planets are not taken into account. And uh, if you are a PD person, you think, wait a minute. This term here is the only term with a derivative. It's dominant order. Dominant order terms often play an important role in the PD. If you remove it, it can change completely the behavior of the equation. And if you are a physicist, you think, wait. When I linearize, I remove the entropy conservation. Maybe it completely changes the physics from the nonlinear to the linear equation. So there is a case that there really should not be trusted the linear approximation. In fact, in 97, Californian physicist Isichenko argued that the approach to equilibrium for this and that reason should very slow and he gives a heuristic reasoning that you should expect for the nonlinear model, the equation to approach equilibrium only like inverse of time, so very slowly. But at the, almost the same time, two Italian mathematicians constructed some solutions that decay exponentially fast, contradicting the previous claim. As you see, because it was kind of a confusion. It's good to have a good theorem from time to time here, when you see that even within physicists there is no agreement, that you can help clear up the picture. All the more that uh, numerical simulations are tricky in large time. Here are two sets of numerical simulations about the logarithm of the electric field done in large time with precise simulation programs and the same initial conditions. Two different methods. Look how different is the long time behavior that is predicted. So at least one of them is wrong. And look here, if we wait large enough, this picture is the logarithm of the ratio between the nonlinear electric field and the linearized one. And you see that even if the agreement is good in small time, in large time, the quantity of energy that goes in the, due to the nonlinearity becomes quite large. So you have to build a nonlinear theory of it. In 2009, with uh, my former PhD student Clément Mouault, now in uh, Cambridge and Paris, we proved such a theorem. We consider the periodic system, because life is already very difficult, so let's not discuss boundary conditions and put everything in a periodic box. And uh, we took an interaction potential W, which was possibly singular, but no more singular than the Newton potential. The Newton potential was exactly the limit case at which we could prove the theorem. Maybe it's an accident or maybe it's something deep. And we started from a linearly stable, analytic, homogeneous equilibrium, F0 of V. And then we perturbed it and took an initial datum that is very close, some good norm. And we solved the Vlasov equation. So this is a general setting that we'd like to check. And the question is whether there is damping or not. And we prove that, yes, the force does decay exponentially fast to zero. So this proved the 
not linear Landau damping in the sense that there is really Landau damping not just for the linearized equation, but also for the nonlinear equation. It's good that you can give an answer to the problem, but of course you would like the answer to give some information, the proof to give some information. And this probably is more important than the answer. So let me say a few things about that. First, we also prove something that you don't find in the physics literature, that not only does the force decay to zero, but the distribution does converge to some steady state in large time. The convergence is weak, and that is in the order of things. The estimate is quantitative, and maybe this is the most important. We identified that besides confinement and mixing, which was known to be important ideas behind this Landau damping, mixing of particles and trajectories, a key was the regularity. In a way, the Landau damping, that's the way we see it, is a regularity decay, is a decay based on regularity. And a very good analogy for mathematicians, very strongly based, is the study of Fourier coefficients of a smooth function. You take a smooth function and you look at the Fourier coefficients. These Fourier coefficients will decay all the faster as your function is smooth. The decay that you see in the Fourier is a bit the same nature as the decay that you see here in the Landau damping. Because it's regularity, the theorem depends on the regularity that we put. We prove it for analytic data. And uh, it's exponential convergence. This can be extended to some lower regularity. <coughs> Namely, Jevre regularity in which the decay in Fourier is like a fraction of exponential. Doing this, we lose exponential convergence, but this is in the order of things. Recall that there is a dictionary between smoothness and Fourier. A smooth distribution is one that you can differentiate at all orders, and it corresponds to the Fourier transform decaying faster than any inverse power of the frequency. An analytic distribution corresponds to the Fourier transform decaying exponentially. And in between, you have the Jevre regularity, in which the decay is like a fractional exponential. And we prove it for some Jevre regularity up to some critical fractional exponent. Physical comments is how to reconcile, reconcile the fact that there is a trend to equilibrium and the fact that there is no entropy increase. The answer was already understood by some physicists decades ago. Others still did not get the point, as you can see from various papers. The answer is that information goes to small velocity scales where it becomes invisible. In a way, it vanishes into thin air because these very fast oscillations, at some point you cannot observe them because what you see from the force is an average of the distribution, a convolution. And the convolution operation will remove these fast oscillations. Lyndon Bell wrote it very well. A system whose density has achieved a steady state, like you have a galaxy that looks at rest, will have information about its birth still stored in the peculiar velocities of its stars. If you were able to measure the velocities of all the stars, you could reconstruct the past of the galaxy. But you cannot measure the velocities. What can you measure? the force that is exerted to you by the combination of all the stars. This force is an average over all the velocities and the positions. So you will not see these velocity distributions. The, uh, there is a loss of information that allows the apparent irreversibility. <coughs> Numerical illustration is this. If you look at the distribution function, after some time it looks like this, or the perturbation. After some larger time like this, it oscillates faster and faster in velocity variable. This is not a quantum equation, even though you have these equations. It's perfectly classical mechanics. It's an effect of the mixing of particles. And if you look at the energy, for instance, in a plasma, the energy does these oscillations that are known as Langmuir waves. But on top of that, you have this decay, which is exponential because this is in logarithmic scale this overall decay of the energy because of the averaging. This was the basis of the paper. This was a large paper, as you see, 
180 pages, and uh, in spite of this, essentially proving just one theorem, this uh, perturbation. However, divided in many intermediate estimates. Let me describe one of them. Uh, let me skip this. Let us, because this is description of the nice norm that we use to measure everything, but let's skip this here. One key step is the proof is to rewrite the problem as a regularity problem. Instead of proving that the force decay to zero, we say that we want to prove that the solution of the equation is regular. You will say, how can it be regular because it oscillates very fast? Okay, but let us assume that it oscillates very fast at a rate which I control and which is exactly the rate of the solution of the free transport equation in which there would be no interaction. So I compare the equation with zero interaction to the nonlinear equation with interaction. And uh, I replace the equation, I change the background here by a distribution in which all I assume that it's given, maybe not stationary, but has regularity bounds comparable to the solution in large time of the zero interaction function. And I want to prove that the distribution F will homogenize. And for this, I try to find an equation on the spatial average of f. That is, integrate in v, take the norm of this, and want to make an equation, and you work hard and hard, and you relate it to some integral equation. In the integral equation, you know it's like this. This is my perturbation at time t, and it depends on the perturbation at times before. If I'm an evolution equation, what happens at next time will depend on the past. And there is a kernel here, k of t tau, that tells you how much I care at time t about what happened at time tau. And uh, you work on the kernel, and the smaller it is, the best it is. It you know, shows that the future will not depend much on the past. But however hard you try to bound it, it will always be linear in time. And this corresponds to these oscillations. Now, linear in time is not good. If you have an integral equation with a kernel that is linear in time, you apply your Grunval lemma, it's like exponential t square. This is very, very unstable. You don't want this. This is very bad. However, when you look at the kernel, and this is the expression, it's like a supremum over frequencies that are integers of uh, some quantity like this. This kernel has a tendency to concentrate as time goes by. This is the kernel for time 10, for time 100, for time 1,000. And look, this picture, it looks crazy. It tells you that if time is 100, to understand what will come next, what I need most preciously to know is what happened at time 50, at half time, or at quarter time, or things like this. So the kernel concentrates on discrete previous times. This is concentration is due to the fact that there are in the graph of equations, because of all these oscillations, there are oscillations. But sometimes the oscillations don't compensate. This you think of it as some resonance. And in fact, it is understood in plasma physics. So first we get this kernel, we thought we were becoming crazy, but then discuss with people and they tell us about this plasma echo experiment. This is beautiful. Let me explain to you, as was understood by the physicists in the 60s, the plasma echo. Here I am physicist in my lab, I prepare a plasma. What is a plasma? Plasma is a gas in which you uh, separate the electrons from the nuclei. And then you have a soup of electrons that move fast. You wait until it is at rest. And at initial time, you send a pulse, an electric field, in such a way that it is oscillating according to some spatial pattern for a fraction of a second. And you wait, and this creates a disturbance in the electric field. There are the oscillations and the damping. When it is again at equilibrium, you send a second pulse with a different frequency, again for a fraction of a second. And again, it oscillates, and uh, you see an electric field, and then it will disappear. And then you do nothing and just measure the electric field. 
And at some particular time, you will see a spontaneous echo. Electric field was zero, and it will rise again and be back again to zero. This time is called, known as the echo. It's a time in which it somehow the memory from this impulse and from this pulse combine at some particular time, which depends on the time here and the frequencies, to produce some effect that you can see. This is known as the echo. It's very important also in uh, practical experiments. People even use this echo to measure how much a plasma is diffusive, things like this. What we learn from this is first, now we understand, to know what happened here, if I just focus on this, it's not important. I have to know what happened then and then. And it tells you that plasmas are systems that react with delay, in a way. Delay is important. When you have an integral equation, delay means extra stability. How to understand it on very simple baby models? Of course, remember, if you have a linear kernel in time and a Grunewald equation, you have the monsterly bad exponential t square estimate. This kernel is linear in time. If now I take a kernel that is linear, but the mass is spread over time 0 to t, much better. I have an exponential estimate. If I put all the mass of the kernel at half time now, that means there is a delay of exactly t over 2. Then the growth is much, much slower. Amusingly, it is this exotic growth t to the power log t. Plasma systems are not that simple. But because there is this echo phenomenon, the extra decay results in a slow growth of the modes. How slow? Well, a good baby model to think of gravitational interaction would be this one. A bunch of functions, numbered, one, two, three, etc. And there is a coupling between one and the next one. And the coupling is with the kernel T, 1 over k squared, tells you about the strength of interaction, is like 1 over r, r squared, and 1 over k squared, like for Newton interaction. And here, you see the, the echo, the delay? Here the time is not time t, but time kt over k plus 1. It's a bit less than t. This extra decay results in a sub-exponential growth, which is like a fractional exponential. So the good estimate from the right-hand side results in a loss which is less than exponential. And this is good, because you can compensate this sub-exponential growth by the linear exponential decay and beat it. And once you have understood it's a problem of loss of regularity estimate, then you enter, you enter in a regime in a number of techniques that is known that Kolmogorov told us in uh, his way on solving the kolmogorov fernold moser problem precisely. If you are in a problem in which uh, you have a loss of regularity, you look at the linearized equation and the estimate on the solution is not as good as the estimate on the right-hand side, but you lose regularity in a perturbative context, you can regain this regularity by opposing to this loss of regularity the super-fast convergence of the Newton scheme. Newton scheme, we learn, is you want to find the zero of some function, some solution of equation. We approximate each time by the linear approximation and solve that equation. And again and again and again. And this has been known by people as a Babylonian algorithm for solving square roots for thousands of years. And this converges tremendously fast like an exponential of exponential. So even if you are losing some big constants in your scheme because of the regularity loss and accumulation of echoes, the Newton algorithm will help you regain them. OK. I think I've told the essential. You work out the Newton scheme for the Vlasov equation. Of course, it's a big mess because there's no free lunch. And then you work it, and you understand it's very much like the story of kolmogorov arnold moser It works well because, in a way, linearized Vlasov equation is a completely integrable system because it can be solved frequency by frequency, and this was known to people even from the time of Landau. Okay, so I've been a bit quick 
on the and uh, I've been badly using my time so that I'm late. It's time to conclude. Physical conclusions of this story. And when you have a good mathematical theorem, you like to think that there are physical conclusions. First, here in this story, Landau and Kolmogorov have met. They met in real life, but not on this problem. And we saw more precisely that three of the most famous paradoxes of modern classical physics are related. The kolmogorov arnold moser theorem that tells you that some situation can remain ordered for all times, even if it's not dictated by some law. The plasma echoes that tell you that some information that you thought you had lost is still stored somewhere and you can retrieve it after some delay. And the Landau damping, which tells you that some system will homogenize even though it's not driven by entropy. They are all related, but only in the nonlinear regime. It's ironic because Landau was working specifically on the linear regime. You can draw a more precise parallel between one and the other. This is classical mechanics in both sides, but this is finite dimension, this is infinite dimension. In both cases, it's near a completely integrable system. In both cases, you have a parameter epsilon. On one hand, it is the strength of coupling planet to planet. On the other hand, it's the strength of the nonlinearity. Statistics plays in both, but a very different role. Here it's in the choice of trajectories. Here it's because statistics is incorporated in the model. One big difference. In kolmogorov arnold moser theory, most trajectories are stable. While here, all solutions are stable near the equilibrium. This is due to the fact that in kolmogorov arnold moser you solve an equation which is, such as to speak, static. Well, here, this is dynamic. You go in time. It's as if in kolmogorov arnold moser you would make an average over trajectories. Here, the resonances in Kolmogorov problem, the resonances are made because of the, uh, the problems of the relation between the trajectories of planets. If it happens that the Earth and Jupiter were always in phase, this would be disaster. But if one day they are in phase, the other out of phase, and so on, you have compensations. If you find relations in the solar system, there is almost a relation, for instance, between the orbit of Jupiter and the one of Saturn, resulting in a long uh, increase of the an increase for the orbit distance for hundreds of years, but then it decreases because it's not really a resonance. In Landau damping, what plays the role of resonances are the echoes due to wave interaction. Big difference. In kolmogorov arnold moser theory, you can work it in a CK, critical regularity, the scheme, finite regularity. While in nonlinear Landau damping, because the loss of regularity is like a fractional exponential, at least in the scheme that we choose, we are unable to do this. And we can only do it with infinite regularity, like Chevre regularity. Then the nash moser method will not work for this one, at least not for the moment, but we are still left with Kolmogorov. We are really making Landau and Kolmogorov meet. And uh, at the end, speculation about the nature of Landau damping. This is a problem uh, about relaxation of particle systems without entropy. It's a universal problem. Most of the statistical physics, from Boltzmann to to recently was understand increase of entropy. Now what happens when entropy is constant? It's a universal problem. Uh, everybody has interpretation and theory, so our interpretation is relaxation from regularity, driven by confined mixing. In a way, you push the question back, because then you will ask, what is regularity? And that's a big issue. In physics, what is regularity? And you can go on and discuss this for for a long time. But at least you have maybe some way to attack, to attack more general problems of constant entropy relaxation in particle systems, on which for the moment the only handle that we have to, to look at this is this Landau damping effect. So maybe it's first step in some virgin territory. Thank you.